Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. That's something that uh, people might like to request order, please. Yeah, we'll request yes. it all you want. That, all right, yeah. good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. Brief review of the uh, college rules. The first one is one fool at a time. The second one is no personal attacks. Never. Yeah, never. The uh, format of the college consists of the following. There will be a brief announcements period, followed by our speaker who will speak up to an hour. Then there will be a question and answer period. And then our infamous rebuttal period where you guys will be able to get to say your piece on our own subject. Rachel Elfant tonight from the Chicago Area Peace Action provides resources and opportunities for empowerment through active grassroots participation in the growth global movement for economic and environmental justice. The Earth and its inhabitants are endangered by the twin threats of global climate change and nuclear war, either which could end the world as we know it. Their particular points are we embrace a world free of the glowing devastation of global climate change, we work to reduce and eliminate the danger of nuclear weapons and excessive military spending, we promote peace and reject warfare as a valid method of resolving conflict, we confront the core systematic issues of political and corporate institutions that support ever increasing financial inequalities and block opportunity for all to share in the earth's mind. Let's welcome Rachel Alphonse up to the stand and give her a round of applause. We don't want any growth around here. Hello everybody, thank you for having me. Um, so today we're going to be talking about something called degrowth and this goes really well as you'll see as the presentation goes on with kind of the mission that um, CAPA, Chicago Area Peace Action, stands for. Um, and just uh, with a show of hands, has anybody ever heard of the degrowth movement? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Has anybody ever heard of degrowth, the degrowth movement? Great, so not too many people. So I do have a pretty interactive presentation. If you would like to interact, I would ask you to take out your smartphones or iPads if you have any and go to www.menti.com. Okay, so I'm going to give you about two seconds, two minutes to do this. www.menti.com if you have a smartphone and then use the code 286801. So if you do have a smartphone, please do do this because it will help. I'm actually going to grab mine really quick. This is a radiation now. It's going to kill you. Charlie. All right, so go ahead and do that. And as you do that, if you've already entered the code, and if you haven't, that's okay too. I want you to think about what words pop into your head when you hear the word degrowth or degrow. What kind of do you think of when you. Excuse me, is someone asking me? The code again? The code is at the top, 286801. It's at the top right there, 286801. So if you know about degrowth or not, just write down in, in your phone um, a word that pops into your mind when you hear degrowth. <laughs> and it will begin to pop up on the screen. Okay, 286801. 286801. Can you repeat the address on that? www.menti.com. Menti.com. Use the code 286801. So I only have one person who wrote something. Anybody else? This is not a very inner net savvy crowd. I'm just That's okay. I'm getting there. I'm if getting you there. don't, if you don't want to participate via this way, just shout it out. What words do you think of when you hear degrowth? And I'll write it in my phone. Recession. Okay, great. <laughs> Anti-consumerism. Okay, great. Hold on. Recession. Anti-consumption. I'll put. 
I see some other ones going up there. They're slowing down. What did I hear? Depression. Find what you need. So minimalist. Simple life. Simplicity. <coughs> what else do we have up here? I see nature, clean, less, intelligent. Can people hear me still? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I yell. I'm a yoga teacher. Yoga teachers don't always yell, but I do. We can we can hear you fine. All right. Any uh, any other words? Yell it out. Amish. Huh? Amish. 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 Great. Depression. Depression. We've got up here. De-evolution. De-evolution. I like it. I don't know how to. De-evolution. Bankruptcy. All right, so I'm going to end with bankruptcy as we move on. <laughs> she heard you too. I know. I hope that uh, through this presentation, some of these uh, words will uh, go away. Some of them are great. <coughs> that goes with degrowth and degrowth, but other words are not yeah, are not so degrowth. Anyway, so we're going to start off with something that you may not think of. What is neoliberalism? Do we all know what neoliberalism is? No. Raise your hand if you do. Either way, we're going to talk about it if you do or don't. Great, we have a few hands that do. I hate it, so I don't know if we're going to get along. All right, so it's a set of ideas, firstly, since about 1920s. It was sort of implemented, or the pioneer of it was Milton Friedman from our very own University of Chicago. Um, yeah. We can clap or not. <laughs> um, but it really wasn't implemented in the United States till about the 70s and 80s, and that was through Reagan. Um, and then uh, also with Thatcher in the UK. So uh, do we, have we all heard of the Chicago Boys? Those are students from the University of Chicago who were um, taught under Milton Friedman to help spread these ideas, neoliberal ideas, across the world in Chile, Argentina, Poland, Russia, uh, Bolivia, um, the list goes on. It is a way of running a country, and that goes from uh, running public services like health care and education. It is a way of dealing with social issues and problems, and it favors free market capitalism. Okay? So, what characterizes neoliberalism? What are its characteristics? The first, we'll get to those, yes. The role of the state and government should be decreased. I've heard some other ones, taxes should be lowered. Freer markets will lead to social goods. And regulation is bad. So um, I'm going to unpack some of these. So first off, it's easier to trade across borders um, because it's therefore better for profits. Um, not only is regulation bad, but it dictates deregulation. Um, even when it comes to workers' rights, environment, health, and safety standards, um, it's basically framed around creating a better environment for businesses. Um, and not just businesses, but big businesses. It supports the private sector, I heard that. Um, and like I said, dictates deregulation, even including social service, even, even such as social services should be provided by the private sector. So basically it stands with policies that financialize and commodify basically everything and claims that that is what is best for the economy and that is also what is best for the well-being of a society, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Not necessarily. <laughs> well, we'll go on. So why should we be looking at neoliberalism? 
The first reason is that it is the dominant way that most governments think about their economies and societies. Not just the dominant way, but it has been purposely and intentionally spread through the Chicago Boys and Other Means by uh, getting involved with other um, uh, uh, elections in other countries. Okay. Um, it is the guiding service for any policy. Any policy first has to think about these, ne these neoliberal views. It shapes how governments deliver public services, plans economies, etc. And then four, it is the go-to set of political ideals from health to education to milita military, etc. So the, these are political ideals that is the standpoint of how decisions are made, it, especially in the United States, which is where we have been, uh, which is where it was pioneered. Um, so I'm going to add my opinion here. My hope, um, as the next slide comes, it will be about degrowth, is that this neoliberal um, period of time, my hope is that it is a spectrum on the timeline. It is just a speck on the spectrum that comes and goes. Because there is a lot of bad that comes with it. And if you are not affected by the bad, that doesn't mean that the bad hasn't occurred, okay? So we're going to start with what is degrowth? I put the French term up here because that's where it was originally um, made, um, decroissance, I don't speak French, that just means degrowth. It was um, um, sort of discussed or thought upon um, in the 1970s by a French uh, scholar named Ander Gross, and his ideas basically reflected a voluntary simplicity. Um, and the value, the, he drew on values such as, such as um, humanism, enlightenment, um, anthropology, and human rights. And it's sort of been dormant, I would say, until about the mid, um, between 2000 and 2010, which is when it became a little bit more scholarly or brought up in academics. And that is, has been primarily the case in Europe. It's an umbrella term. It critiques the centrality of economic growth in contemporary societies. I want you to think about that for a moment. It embraces alternatives for ecological sustainability and social justice. It's my bad that I put in this slide sustainability just because that term in and of itself is a very Western word to um, greenwash people, I would say. The thinking that they're doing something that's good for the world that is sometimes marketed uh, through business models. It recognizes human values such as happiness, care, and community as precedents. So we may think that we um, have those values, which I think personally and individually everybody does, or I hope that people do. But um, from a political standpoint, there are different values that neoliberalism has, uh, has diffused. And then it's a social movement as well. So it is a theory it is, it's very theoretical, but it's also a social movement. And it becomes embodied in other social movements, okay? So I wanna talk about what isn't degrowth, because I know I'll get a lot of uh, critiques about this, especially in the United States where we are such a growth-centered society. Hopefully, um, anyways. Um, so it is not, striving for negative economic growth at all. We'll go through this in a little bit. It does not equal austerity. And it does not call for pre-modern living conditions, which a lot of um, people 
people who have critiqued degrowth will say. Such as bridge wood So here's a graphic, and I want to explain this. So we've got the elephants. We've got three elephants here, and then we've got a snail. And I'm not sure if everybody can read it, so I'm going to go ahead and read it and describe it for everybody. So we've got the elephant. This all here is growth, GDP, neoliberalism. The elephants are that. <coughs> here we've got the chunk going up. We've got growth. We're doing great. It is more of the same. Here we've got the elephant chunk going stagnant or stationary. It is the same of the same. Then we've got the elephant trunk going down. Can we guess what that one is? Recession. Recession, great. Less of the same. In fact, probably something negative. Then on the all the way to the left, what is that? Snail. It's a snail. What does a snail usually represent? Libertarian party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the slow food movement, maybe. Uh, what else does it represent? I just said a, a descriptive word that it represents. Slow. 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 It's really slow, right? The snail moves very slow. Um, it's degrowth. Simply different. It is different. I'm not asking. I'm not. Um, Promoting degrowth as a recession. It is not less of the same. It is not this negative growth. And um, the scholars who chose the word degrowth did that on purpose. And they did that on purpose because growth in our mind is something that is positive. We need more. We need more money. But they used the word degrowth to, to kind of move away from the um, positive connotation that growth represents. Growth can be good, but it also can be bad. Okay, it's not negative nor positive. And that's the idea here. Degrowth is not negative. It is not something that is bad. It is just simply different. It's a new way of thinking. It's the next spot on our historic uh, timeline. So what does degrowth critique of the growth-centered world? There are very particular things that it um, critiques. And there's sort of four things. I'm going to put all four bullet points up first because I think it's important to see that there's these four central ideas or um, central um, <coughs> topics. It critiques economic growth. It critiques um, parts of ecology, sociocultural, and then socio-environmental. So first and foremost is the economic part. So perpetual growth is not possible. But not only is it not possible, the more important point I want to make is that GDP is not an adequate measure of well-being. And for some reason, the United States seems to think that that is the best way to evaluate a society. Ecological. Growth leads to ecological degradation. That is true. Sorry. Growth-centric economies are reliant on non-renewable resources. <coughs> Three, sociocultural. Injustices are inherent to the economic system. <coughs> Productivism, consumerism, workerism, economism leads to marginalization of other ways of living, okay, or other ways of being. The study of the ways of being is called ontology. And the study of ways of thinking is called epistemology. Growth-centered societies tell you that you cannot think or, or, or learn in, in other ways. That this is the only pathway for development. This is the only pathway to succeed. Sociocultural. We already went through that. Socio-environmental. 
growth causes unequal ecological exchange leading to global inequalities. I use the word global to imply global and local. They are one and the same in this case. And I want to ask if anybody knows what unequal ecological exchange is, because that's a big uh, phrase that may be lost. One person, maybe. So unequal ecological exchange is when we commodify nature, or um, and when we, for example, um, not just money, um, or, or say a mining community in another part of the world, the United States has a factory in that community, and they get all the profits and all the money, you know. Sure, sure, they are paying uh, the government of that country where the factory is located in some way, shape, or form, but what they are not paying for is the time and energy of the people there, okay? So that is an unequal exchange, whether or not we, we think so or not, because it's not just about the money, it's also about the time and energy. This goes in your mouth. All right. And then I want to be clear here when we're talking about this, this idea was um, brought up or thought of in, in France in the 1970s. And this does apply to the so-called developed regions of the world. But it's a reduction of production and consumption in the global north that liberates the global south from the one-sided western paradigm of development, allowing a self-determined path of social organization and development. That um, we tend to think maybe that these developing or global south countries are backwards or behind or um, less yeah, progressed. Yeah. And those are Western words put upon <laughs> these other parts of the world because we see a development as a linear timeline that has to progress in a certain stepwise function. So once you complete this step, you have to do this step. And that is what we are trying to de-unlearn. Okay? So what kind of growth is challenged in degrowth? First and foremost, the growth of CO2 emissions. This is always coupled with economic growth. And uh, the growth of biophysical throughput. Capital accumulation and productivism. GDP growth. Quantitative expansion of national economies as an aim in and of itself. And then social acceleration and big social and a big social metabolism. So I want to talk about social acceleration and big social and a big social metabolism. Does anybody know what social acceleration is? No. How about cancer? Acceleration. Social acceleration. Huh? Is that Acceleration when you're at a party. Does that mean this type of things that have been happening recently with the compression of growth and timelines and the change that uh, Thomas Friedman had, has talked about in his book, The World is Flat? I don't think so. Okay. So um, a scholar... Uh, people at the top making most all the money almost yeah. from, the, from the growth. Well, I can agree with that, but that's not social acceleration. So social acceleration and um, as the in New York, like how, how you grow in yourself, how how you grow yourself, like how it more has to do with interactions between people. So as defined by Hartmut Rosa, is a, a author. He wrote about social acceleration. Um, it's that the pace of society is increasing so much that there's a danger of falling behind. Um, that we're accelerating the pace of life so much that we find ourselves in a time poverty. Do we ever feel like we don't have enough time? Yeah, because that, that's what we suffer from. 
Um, and I will say that in our modern world here, we do have methods of decelerating, deceleration um, that we try to sort of implement in our lives. And that could be, for example, unplugging or uh, yoga and meditation, you know, taking time for ourselves um, or returning to the good old days, right? That's decelerating. But that is also, um, for the most part, market-based. Right. For the most part, that is also um, um, capitalizing on. And then big social metabolism. Who does anybody have a guess of what so a social metabolism is? Metabolism like who? Who's eating up? You're very sarcastic. Sir. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? We're using up raw materials and don't have to be used up. You're close. You're very close. Anybody else? Well, what did he say? He said using up raw materials that don't have to be used up. He's close. So metabolism, kind of like our digestive system. We see food, we eat it, it digests, and it goes to waste. How fast does a society do that to our resources? Too fast. Really fast. Yeah. So that's our social metabolism. Degrowth challenges our ginormous and fast social metabolism. Degrowth actions put ecological sustainability, social justice, and human flourishing at the core of society. So I want to go over the descriptive term flourishing. We tend to, uh, degrowthers tend to use the word flourishing instead of growth. Um, sort of um, just switching those two words. Um, emphasize values like mutual aid, care, solidarity, conviviality, democratic decision making. Endorse cooperatives, community organizations, and then it's implemented Where's on Tim? different He'll levels, local, municipal, state, regional, global, and then encourages other paths of development. So I talked about this a second ago about um, how um, we tend to think here in the United States that there is a certain way that we need to develop and that it is linear. But in reality, development can go any direction, okay? And that is called respecting other ontologies and other epistemologies. So in other parts of the world, parts of degrowth are already happening because they are rejecting how the West has dominated the rest of the world. Not just dominated through colonizing, but also through the way people think, okay? So uh, uh, examples are Buen Vivir. I will not go through um, this uh, too much, but Buen Vivir, for example, was implemented on in the Equatorian and Bolivian Constitution. Swaraj in India, Ubuntu in South Africa, and then examples of this could be transition towns um, in the US, UK, and other parts of the world. And then before I go on, um, I want to, I'm reading this book called Utopia for Realists. Has anybody read it or heard of it? I really recommend it. I'm, I'm only like 100 pages through. But they, uh, the author um, shows uh, this graph in, in the book um, that the higher the GDP of a country, the more inequalities it has. And that's because he argues um, that we're using GDP to make everything cheaper except for services like healthcare and education um, that really would help the people so instead we make a fridge really cheap or cheaper than it should be um, or food cheaper than it should be um, like in through fast food I mean um, and anyways it's just it's just very interesting I, I really recommend it Oh, and then, and then apparently, uh, I don't know how long ago, they uh, expected 2014 to be filled with leisure time and uh, that people would only work 15-hour work weeks because, and that people would suffer from boredom. And that is not the case. And in fact, we have only been working harder. 
um, and more. Anyways, I really recommend the book. So these are some of the key words that uh, talk about degrowth um, that you should or could uh, say now if I gave you the question uh, at the beginning about what pops into your head when you think of degrowth. Um, new economy, cooperatives, urban gardening. There are some words up here you may not know, like Nautopians. Um, does anybody know what a no no Nautopian is? What is it? I'm going to tell you in a second. Nautopian? Nautopian, yeah. So, um, a Nautopian is like uh, remaking, uh, res like kind of like a secondhand store or like a bike kitchen or like a library, but instead of books, maybe like um, tools like a handyman could use so that you could rent it or use it or borrow it without a cost. You just, it's a place. Uh, that you borrow goods that you need that it's not just not worth to buy. Um, let's see, basic maximum income, work sharing, uh, post-normal science. Um, that would be uh, like having a, an opinion on science, which we are entering in a very, very real post-normal science era. Uh, which that we need to have an opinion on the sci objective science. And scientists need to have an opinion on their objective science. So now I have a quiz for you, but no one's entered the quiz with their cell phones. I'm going to put it up anyways, and you can okay. yell the answer. So I'm going to start question one. Answer fast to get more points. Oh, no, it's not up. <laughs> All right, so what is the closest definition of degrowth? We've got A, a strategic way to put a rich country into poverty. B, it's going to show the answers. Movement based on ecological economics and anti-consumerism. Or C, a negative growth or reduction in an economy or population. Two. Good, so it already has the answer up there. Two. Good, movement. Movement based on ecological econ economics and anti-consumerism. Okay. No one participated. No results. All right, so I'm going to read it again. The answer will show, but I want you to hear the other... Uh, the other <laughs> options. <laughs> Do advocates of degrowth condemn technology? No. No. Yes, technology no. is their worst enemy. No, why shouldn't every community have an open access printing press? No. No. No or yes? Yes. No. 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 No, thank no. you. Yeah. We do not condemn technology. They do not yeah. condemn technology. And the answer will show, right? Open now, check. No. Why shouldn't every economy community have an open access printing press? Mm -hmm. Start question three. There's only five. Should degrowth be a bottom up or top down policy? It is a movement and should be backed up by people to work. Two, or B, we are in a dire situation. Policies now, whether people agree or not. Yes. Or three, it's about changing mentalities, so that can only work from bottom up. We've got A and C. Okay, so not we are in dire situation, although I would say I would say B, but that's not what degrowth is saying. Number four. This sounds ridiculous. If some parts of the global south <coughs> need to develop, how can we ask them to degrow? A, global north should tell them how to act since we made these mistakes. B, there are small movements already occurring all over the planet. C. It's about a self-determined path of development for the global south. It's C. I heard C. B and C. Great. 
We can talk about it. Okay. Q and A. Sit down there. <laughs> All right, last question. Why is this concept important in modern society? A, requires a change in thinking. B, yeah. economic growth is not necessary, is not a necessary condition for a successful society. C, the U.S. is the number one consumer in the world and has decreased effects globally. D, the capitalistic model is a narrative that normalizes an imperial, oh, I forgot what I put for SOL. Correct. My bad, I forgot what I put for, standard of living, imperial standard of living. Okay, so I'm just going to go through this one, they're all correct, so why is this concept important in modern society? All four requires the change in thinking, economic growth is not a necessary condition for a successful society. The U.S. is the number one consumer in the world and has uh, reduced, decreased effects locally. And ca the capitalistic model is a narrative that normalizes an imperial standard of living. Great, so now I'm going to talk about the Green New Deal because that's um, oh, yeah. the climate, one of the climate change. Uh, so in Chicago Area Peace Action, we've got two committees. We've got a foreign policy committee and a, and a climate committee. I'm on the climate committee. And one of our campaigns is building a, a Green New Deal coalition uh, in Illinois. So um, I want to compare and contrast the Green New Deal and deep growth. So reading it straight from the slide, the Green New Deal points to where the system has stepped over boundaries and bolstered and maintained inequalities through our growth mentality. It is the first resolution to include environmental, social, and economic justice into one nationwide solution and free them from their issue and solution silos. That's why it's important that these um, Something like the Green New Deal I really admire because we can't have individualized bills. They need to go together. Social justice, economic justice, environmental justice, human rights, and climate justice needs to go together. They cannot be separated anymore. And with bills, if they're going separately, we're not going to be getting the whole problem. So there's a few similarities between the Green New Deal and degrowth. The first one is thinking big. We can say that they are both very visionary ideas, correct? Yes. Almost aspirational, as many people uh, will say, in a negative way, which I disagree with. I find it aspirational, but I find it really important and attainable, actually. Second, diverse solutions. It is not a one-size-fits-all platform. Okay. It is diverse for our diverse worlds. Uh, one thing that degrowthers do that I really like is that they stop using the word universe and start using the word pluriverse. Okay. We live in a very pluriversal world. Okay. Grounded in movement struggles. Um, like I said before, these... Um, um, issue silos and solution silos. Um, it really unites environmental, climate, social, human rights, feminism. It's built around a, an idea of a new economy. Um, Debt-free, cooperative economy, a caring economy. Um, and this includes, uh, for example, we don't always have to think about what is a green job. A green job can be a teacher. What is a low carbon impact job? What is a low um, environmentally impactful job? That could be um, that could be healthcare, <laughs> teaching, community driven um, jobs. It's not just who can put solar panels on all the houses, okay? There's very many ways to be, uh, have a green job. And a caring economy. It's post-carbon, post-capitalist, it really is. Okay, this is not, um, 
like I said before, I'm, I'm really hoping this neoliberal um, kind of time period is really just a speck on the, on the, on the timeline. It's not, it's not um, uh, the end all be all. And that book I was talking about, Utopia for Realists, really talks about how we need to be striving for utopia if we're going to uh, have change. And, and he makes a good point that capitalism and neoliberalism has really b brought us into the land of plenty. And he uses that word land of plenty, and I think it's important that we see the positives that came from it, but it's not going to get us out of the climate crisis, and it's not going to get us out of the social inequality issues that we have. We need to turn to something new, and that is not bad. It is just being realistic and thinking about a new way to, to think about life. Okay, We don't have to be stuck in our ways. An old dog can learn new tricks. <laughs> It's, both are very internationalist. The one thing I love about the Green New Deal as well, it's not just about the United States. In fact, the United States historically is the number one carbon emitter. We need to take responsibility and pay our debt to the rest of the world, not just the people that live within our borders. Mm -hmm. okay. Now I'm gonna talk about the differences. One is a policy versus a theory. Policy is the Green New Deal, new consensus working on those policies. Degrowth is a theory as well as a movement. The Green New Deal is not rooted in degrowth, but AOC's and Markey's version does not mention growth as a priority in its platform. And then degrowth confronts really hardcore the consumerism as a core issue. And I write up here that it's too spicy for the United States population because we are so ingrained and embedded with consumerism. And that is definitely a difficult thing to address in this society here. And then I was going to show a video, but I can't seem to load it up, a message from the future with AOC. And this talks about the Green New Deal, but it has so many messages about degrowth. I'm going to see if it has loaded. Um, I can't promise that it will, so we may have to move on. I'm going to try one more time. Has anybody seen this video? Hi, really, a message from the future. I don't think it's letting me get onto YouTube. Is that uh, what it's saying? probably because of the block. Ah, the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. 
They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the Federal Jobs Guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. 
I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. And then that is where I end. Resources and suggested readings I have up here. I can um, forward that to somebody that can give you these if you're interested in reading further. Just uh, forward the links and put them up in the YouTube description. Great. I will do that. And that is, um, I'm done. So thank right. you very much. All right. Can you, uh, Ed's going to help you moderate the questions. My, my, uh, if you don't mind, uh, the first question I have is, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of different theories in the past how we need to do change, you know, communism provided the same thing, some of the other utopian visions of the world provided similar goals over time, but they usually are just here and gone, and the market and the usually the social forces proclivitated by Adam Smith in his book has seemed to bend the norm for the last 200 years. Can you comment on if this movement will go forward or will it, uh, does it require, uh, because you know, people buy and sell the markets kind of, you know, with all the growth and everything we've been around. Tell me why this one's going to succeed when all the others have failed. Well, one thing I want to mention is that, um, like the, the slide of the, the elephant, it'll take me a while to get there. It is something yeah. different. It's not uh, rooted in communism or, or socialism or it's, it's something different than what anything we're used to. Second, I don't know if it will, if it will disappear or not. Um, one thing that does give me hope is, is one, the fact that the Green New Deal was even talked about in the House of Representatives and the Senate already to me is like, wow. I've been waiting for that moment for so long. And then two, degrowth, since I learned about it a year and a half ago, it has grown exponentially. Growth in the, in the positive term here. Um, and it is especially gaining momentum in Europe. Um, but when I came here to the United States, I had spoken briefly about degrowth at a um, conference at Loyola University. And um, some guy came up to me at the end and was like, you've never heard anybody talk about degrowth in the United States. We have a chapter here in Chicago. Nowhere else in the United States do we have one. So this is becoming more in the academic world, um, something that is definitely um, gaining momentum here. Um, so I don't know. I've seen it, I've seen it flourishing. Fair enough. Who's next? All right. Um, you know what's happening in China, and what do you think about the developments that are going on there? Um, one, I don't know much about uh, the developments that are going on there. I do know that they were also um, infiltrated by the Chicago Boys. Um, so they're. Rachel, try to repeat the question from oh, here. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, what do I know about China and what do I think to do about them? Is that the question? No, well, what do you think of their path that they're following? What do I think of the path that they're following? Yeah. Well, I think it's funny. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to offend you, but I always think it's funny when the United people of the United States bring up China <laughs> because, like, the United States is the number one um, carbon emitter. Sure, China is number one right now um, but we are <laughs> as far as climate goes much worse um, not that there's a competition but um, also uh, China has been implementing much more solar and renewable energy than the United States has by far um, we're gonna have to wait till I come back sorry but uh, I'm not sure to be honest Next. Okay. Go. thank you um, 
Which uh, Milton Friedman books have you read, and is there any specific arguments within those books that you've read that you disagree with? I have not read his books, but I'm going to. Uh, what's the main one? I, uh, Dr. Seuss. The most well-known one. There's a few. He's got Price Theory. He's Are got Free to Choose. Capitalism, capitalism and Freedom. freedom. Capitalism and Freedom. 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 It's on my list, but I have not read his books. Right here. Well, well, I've read that China has more CO2 emissions than than uh, uh, European Union and, and the United States combined. But anyway, my question was, do you think the uh, Trump economy has been uh, uh, good, and uh, uh, I, I think I think it's been good. It's been caused by tax cuts and also by deregulation. Uh, he's had three percent for the past uh, uh, two three years, and, and Obama never got to two percent. Okay. Um, the question is: Is the Trump economy good? Um, so is the Trump economy good? Oh, sorry, I haven't been reading. Okay. Um, okay. So once again, I see you um, uh, using economy as uh, as a gauge of, of well-being of a society, where I don't agree with. Um, sure, maybe that's true, but that uh, doesn't mean that the earth and our social inequalities are well. Okay. So maybe if the economy is good, fine. It doesn't mean uh, there's other things that are doing well. Right over there. How much of the CO2 emissions from China, because he mentioned that China has a larger CO2 emission, I think you said than the United States and what? Europe. Europe, Europe combined. So how much of their uh, emission of carbon do you think is can be attributed to things they make in China to sell in the United States and Europe? Uh, that is, is a that very right? good point that I'm going to use. Don't we send Did everything? Did everybody hear that question? Okay, the question is, how much of China's CO2 emission is result of offshoring manufacturing from the U.S.? By the end, um, I can't actually answer that question, but I think that that's a very good point. Um, we, yeah, my opinion is that, obviously, <laughs> how much of our products say made in China first? Um, I mean, part of the um, shock, uh, what was it, the shock doctrine by Naomi Klein talks about when the Chicago boys uh, were, in, again, uh, trying to spread their neoliberal ideals is, is putting China as a, as a place for where, where we can have our factories, um, not just the United States, but Singapore. <laughs> um, so, those uh, emissions oh, okay. that China emit uh, that China emits exactly. can be maybe maybe um, related to the United States or, or the United States and the European Union may be guilty of those emissions in reality. Okay, Charlie. Yeah, Rachel, if you go to Disneyland or Epcot, the single longest running amusement <laughs> is the Carousel of Progress. When they sing that song, there'll be a great big beautiful tomorrow. Do you think that message is no longer relevant? That's that should be canceled to the deep growth kind of thinking. Um, first off, I would say deep growth has uh, has hope. Um, they're they may seem uh, negative on on modern day um, stuff, but. Um, I think the point is that um, we need to relearn what it means to pro progress um, and that our sort of one-dimensional perspective in the economy is not, again, not an adequate measure of what it means to progress. Right here. Uh, you mentioned a lot of different countries. Uh, can you name one where this system has, to use your word, flourished? So it's not been implemented um, in like a in a, in a, in a true wholesome way, um, which would be cool. Um, but Buen Vivir, I can give a better example of uh, something called Buen Vivir, which means good living in Spanish. 
um, and that's been uh, discussed or uh, implemented in uh, the Constitution in Ecuador and Bolivia. Okay. Thank and you. Um, I can't, um, I'm not a scholar in Buen Vivir, but there are different levels of Buen Vivir that again rejects um, the westernization of um, thinking, of learning, um, and in the Constitution in both Ecuador and Bolivia, they sort of took the the one of the levels that um, encourages indigenous and um, vulnerable communities to to be um, uh, what's the word included in decision making that affects them um, more so than here. Not, not in the like sort of treaty format, in more of a format of um, like staying true to, to their living, excuse their living situations. Lady in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want a box, yes. Tom? Um, Rachel Do you need a box? gave yes. this presentation for the Capital Climate Group a few weeks ago. And I would encourage you to look at her resource yeah, list. I have the little book called, I think you know, it's... If you have a comment, comments, comments from later. Comment. This, yeah. This is okay. strictly okay. question. Well, you'll have plenty of time. would be, Rachel, could you tell them about the letter, the cooperative agency organizational letter and the purpose of that, and ask people here to help find other organizational signatures? on the Green New Deal. Sure. Yeah, I think, yeah. So um, um, the reason why, especially through, so Chicago Area Peace Action is very much rooted in, um, at least from what I can tell, um, in sort of this anti-neoliberal, anti-neoliberalism. And one thing that's what, what drew me to them, um, you know, whether it's through foreign policy or climate action. And so I sort of, um, put degrowth onto them without asking because I thought it really um, dovetailed well with their mission. And so um, as the climate um, organizer, climate justice organizer, I am building a Green New Deal coalition. So if you do have an organization uh, that would like to sign on to that, we are looking for, for signers. That would be great because we're going to be using it when we uh, make lobby visits. <coughs> the word epistemology uh, incorrectly you um, you defined it as a, a study of thinking but it's really a study of knowledge, knowledge creation knowledge what knowledge creation creation well a study, study of knowing of, and study of knowledge how we yeah, know a study of building knowledge how we know what we know basic <coughs> difficult types of knowledge not facts but uh, how did you how are you using the epistemology and ontology, the study of reality or being, how are you using those? Did and you, how did does you that, that question? yeah, um, so he, yeah, he asked me, um, that I said that I, I uh, referred to ontology and epistemology. Um, ontology is the study of being, while epistemology, I had incorrectly said the study of thinking, in which it is the study of, of knowledge or the study of uh, creating knowledge or building knowledge how you how you get um, knowledge and the reason why I uh, referred to this is because degrowth has is, is rooted much in um, colonization and how colonization isn't just um, something that happened years ago but also is uh, continuing to happen through our minds so not just you know us I mean um, uh, for example, when there was colonization, there was also, a, you know, with missions, you know, telling people how to live, how to be, how to think, um, and that, and degrowth uh, would like to step back from that, and that's where these other movements happening over all over the world um, should be able to have a self-determined path of development, self-determined path to to be um, so ontology and epistemology are very important to uh, the growthers oh no you had a question in the back yeah thank you for your talk 
predominantly United States owned corporations and wealthy families of the millionaire billionaire class hoard extreme amounts of capital and offshore accounts. Um, could you talk about the concept of in regards to these challenges that we have in the 21st century, how standing money is as dangerous as standing armies or standing governments? I like that question. Did everybody hear it? I can repeat it. One more time. You hear it. Repeat it very loudly. Predominantly well, United States own corporations and wealthy families of the millionaire and billionaire class hoard extreme amounts of capital in offshore accounts. Um, in regards to the challenges we face in the 21st century, uh, how would it how would it be if we change that based on the concept of the warning, standing money is as dangerous as standing armies or standing governments? Everybody hear it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, so the first thing I'd like to say is, what does uh, the word currency mean? Money. It's a government-issued uh, thing. What else does it mean? <laughs> What's a current? Uh, uh, or something is current. Uh, a medium of exchange. No, I mean a, uh, flow. A flow, like a current, a river. It flows. Um, so <laughs> for some reason, yeah, in the oligarchy, the, the money isn't flowing. They're not using currency correctly um, or money correctly. Um, so not, I would like to argue even further um, and say that we, we do live in an oligarchy that does not want to change because it would um, weaken its power and privilege. And that goes to not, not just those millionaires, it goes to um, people in the upper class that um, may uh, you know, blame the people that make even more money than them for, for hoarding. Um, and because the oligarchy spends lots of money on big cars, big houses, many big things that they like to have. I mean, um, I think of my own family, to be honest. I have a hard time talking to my, my dad is <laughs> as Democrat as you can be, but he's got this big house and I don't know why he can't downsize. For some reason, social mobility is really um, important in our society, and I, I think uh, sort of that um, that should also be challenged. To be quite honest, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. You're right here. Yeah. All right. Um, I just came from the socialist conference, and uh, it's interesting. I guess. Question, please. Yeah. I, um, I guess you're, can you talk about, you know, the role of the young people educating, you know, these oligarchs and, um, and what do you think about fascism? You've got a very progressive attitude. Do you, would you say there's a fascism problem? Um, in the United States? Do you want to restate that? Is there a fascism? Yeah, what do you, is, um, like at this conference, there's an anti-fascist move up, and I, I you know, we're anti-climate. And like you said, you, we, they're kind of separated, but yet they need to be all integrated. But sometimes I think we're afraid to use the word fascism, and as an economic, systemic problem that has been, you know, oligarchy is softer than fascist. Uh, if you think about, you know, has maybe there been a coup by a military dictatorship that we don't even know about? Do you think <laughs> the word fascist is more appropriate for describing the opposition? Um, I don't know. I, would, I don't have a big comment on that, to be honest. Um, I, I am very critical of the United States. I, I for example, don't don't believe in American exceptionalism. Um, I think there there was one of, of the College of the Complex is a, a speaker coming up, uh, the lie, of, I don't know what it was. It, that to me sounds really interesting uh, that I would like to see. So I am very critical of uh, the United States agenda uh, for year, from years and years and years. Thank you. Charlie. Yes, Rachel, for several hundred years, there was a period of stasis in human society known as the Dark Ages, <laughs> in which the people thought there was no such thing as change. Is this what the, the, 
the perspective that you are advocating? <laughs> Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong. The dark, the dark Ages was a period when people thought there was no change, waiting for the end of the world. Are you, does your organization advocate no change? No, I think the opposite. We're trying to advocate for change. Once you reach the change you want, <laughs> that is it's a stasis, no change environment. Uh, yeah, are you, is that your ideal condition, stasis? No growth, like no growth. No, no, no change is coming. Well, um, this is the level we can reach, that's it. <laughs> Permanent. Um, I'm not sure. Um, All right. I think I find this degrowth uh, thing to be something that not will that will not happen uh, very soon, considering um, our political um, turmoil. You could say not just in the states but worldwide. Um, so I haven't thought too much about what could happen after, because I've been focused on what needs to happen now. Lady over there, Take a follow, follow up. up. You talked about a lot of philosophical terms. What about the term teleological? You know what that means? Huh? Point teleological. Teleological. Point A to point B to the omega point. Infinity. I'm not familiar with that term. Well, <laughs> right here, this lady. Uh, Being a big grocer, that's There was a question that the guy asked over here, where where could you find the growth? And earlier in your talk, you talked about some towns and cities, and I didn't know, I'm. you went by it so fast, I didn't pick up what you said about those different towns. You named several, and I wonder if that was the answer to his question. Um, are you talking about when I spoke about transition towns? Yeah, something like that. Well, you said transition towns, but then you named them. Oh, no, I was naming um, movements that were occurring in, in the world, um, in other parts of the world, that all are very different from each other. Um, so I, I talked about encouraging other paths of development. So it's the last bullet point here. Uh, Buen Vivir, South Swaraj, that is in India, Ubuntu in South Africa. And these are very different. Um, they're all rooted in degrowth, but they're not um, they're not the same, which is why pluriverse is important. But don't you think that's the answer to his question? When he, he said, where do you find it? Okay. There's many answers to questions. That might be one for you, might be another for him. We have 10 more minutes of questions, so we're going to get to people who haven't asked one, and then we'll get to others. Right here. Um, a question. I wonder if this degrowth, uh, you might also say, is a new growth. It's different from the old growth. Like, at one time we had horses, and we had more horses, better. At some point, oh, we don't need horses anymore. At some point, I think we're entering a new phase, and I can talk about it later on. We need a new, we need a new way to grow. The question is, yeah, if um, degrowth can also be considered new growth, um, which I find a valid point. I think that that's a great. Who else didn't have a question yet? Right over there, I think. Right there. Yeah. You stand. Uh, I, uh, I like the whole idea, but uh, I, I have one uh, concern. You spend a lot of time talking about what degrowth doesn't mean. It seems to me that if you're doing that, then there is a perception problem about the term degrowth. As there have, have you or participated or heard any discussions about trying to find a, a more accurate term that would focus more on the positive, on what degrowth is, instead of what it's not doing. Uh, yeah, um, so I did bring a book here, um, which is called Degrowth, a Vocabulary for a New Era. I will <coughs> take it out now and pass it around. And that discusses basically what this society could look, at, look like and what components it would have. Um, and or what components that um, yeah. would be valued. Um, I, I thought I really, I mean, I guess I, yeah, you're right that I guess I'm talking about what it isn't. That's usually the most um, um, 
critiques about it, so we wanted to clear those up very fast. Um, but I will pass around the book, and I, I do recommend getting it. And as Catherine um, back there told me, um, who is on our board of directors at Chicago Great Peace Action, I really, really recommend uh, looking through these uh, resources that I have. Um, there's, uh, you know, the scholars who, who discuss degrowth are very, uh, uh, they really want to spread the ideas, so there's one that's kind of expensive, the book I have, but the rest are pretty cheap to find, and it, it really dives deep into what it is, that more than what I can talk about. The lady back there, that you, yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, my question is, is it that this country is moving towards this or moving away from this? No. The question was, is the United States moving towards or away from deep growth? Right now, away. <coughs> okay. But we should be moving towards. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Any, this is what I think. We I'm just grabbing the book. Yeah. Okay. Keep, keep we talking. have more time? Bye. Um, we can probably take one or two more questions, and then we should get to rebuttals, because I know there's a lot right of there people. there in fact. Yeah. Um, is the degrowth movement, you think, uh, related to what Naomi Klein was talking about in her book, This Changes Everything. Solving the climate crisis and all of our capitalist problems. Totally. Um, I would say very much so. Right here. Would, would you say that the United States uh, uh, adversely affected Latin, Latin American governments by getting involved in their politics? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. You said yes? Yes. yes. So what else? Yes. Yes. I don't agree. Uh, <laughs> I, I've lived in the, uh, Latin America. My, I'm Mexican as well. My mom's uh, Mexican. And uh, I've, I've lived in Peru and Argentina. And I would say yes. And most of the people, at least my friends, definitely would, would think so. In the back, I'll say that. if you've never read any of Milton Friedman's uh, uh, books, then uh, I'm curious which sources did did you read that cited his works that you were able to critique it? I didn't actually cite his works. I um, am reading from the Shock Doct Doctrine and other books that uh, talk about his policies. So. I have not cited him specifically, but his ideas I do not agree with. Charlie, if degrowth is implemented, are we still going to celebrate Christmas? <laughs> I hope so. Anyone else? I, I have one. One in the back. First, you, sir, yes. There are 24 candidates uh, doing game shows now what? on TV. Are any of them even close, or do any of them discuss any of the aspects of what you're describing? Do yes. any of the Democratic candidates approach the Yes. Who? Um, Warren, Sanders. Those two. Okay. Inslee, Inslee. Anyone else? Any other questions before we move on? Last question here. Last question. Are we, you know, we've got 10 years. Are we going to make it? What's going to happen if we don't do this? This isn't about climate change. This is about climate change. That's not a question for me. I don't know. All right. I hope so. I hope that we do something. This is okay. Let's thank Ed real quick for doing an excellent job of moderating tonight. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's get go ahead and take a count and we'll get the we'll get the How many how many commenters? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve, thirteen. I think we can go about uh, four minutes because everybody's not going to use the time up. Thank you. Sit down. Sit down and uh, you get the last word, by the way. Maybe, okay, maybe three. All right, we'll go three minutes. Let's thank our speaker again one more time. Try to keep it around three minutes. We'll go a little bit in there, but if you guys are ready, uh, Let's give our attention to the uh, comments and uh, let's go forward.
please. Okay, I, I won't get too close to this, okay? I wrote this on July the 4th. I call it compared to what? With all of the criticisms of the shortcomings of America, it is educational to compare the U.S. to other countries. We take in more immigrants than any other country. The U.S. is a beacon of liberty and security around the world. The U.S. was not a co colonial power and has kept peace in the world for decades. In World War II, the U.S. was a source of munitions and equipment for the Allies. We helped defeat Hitler and the Axis powers. There was great loss of life, of American lives in World War II. After the war, we helped rebuild Germany and Japan. The U.S. was politically involved with Latin American countries, but the South American people elected leaders such as got people like Castro, Chavez, and Maduro in, in quest of socialism, which has turned out to be disastrous. South Korea and South Vietnam asked us to assist them against the communist invasion of those countries. Currently, there is an invasion over our southern border. Migrants from many countries are legally coming into our country. It's not just the the Northern Triangle in Mexico, there's other people from Eastern uh, 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 countries coming in throughout the, through, the south, through the southern border. The U.S. takes in 100, about 140,000 illegal migrants in a month. If we keep on taking in the poverty stricken of the world, this great nation will become a third world country. Why must America concede to the values of the progressives the liberals, George Soros, and the UN. This great country must not fall. We must not give in to the anti-American propaganda, the left wing of, of, less, of left wing politicians, and many of our own people. Many of our own people are anti-American. Some even here. Yeah. 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 Well, I wasn't going to say anything, but boy, <laughs> can everyone see that we're in a state of tra transition right now? Yeah. It's going on right now. Yep. So this degrowth thing, that's sort of a hint at, at where we're at. We're, I'll take, a, take a look at all the car manufacturers. What are they doing? They're going to electric cars. Now. I haven't got the new electric cars, they still cost a lot of money, right? Honda is going to come out with a new fit. Uh, it'll be around 18,000, something like that. Uh, 118 miles per gallon. A different world. Do I have to worry about my muffler? No. Do I have to worry about the muffler? Do I, I, I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about it. It's a different, it, it's a different world. There's billions of dollars that's going into it right now. It's happening. And as far as climate change, that's going on too. These people from Central America, why are they coming up here? Not for jobs, they're into starvation right now. Because five years in that area, they haven't had any rain. So those people are going, they're going, some of them are going to Mexico, some of them are coming up here, some are going to South America. They're going all over the place, but they can't live where they're at. It has nothing to do with, uh, uh, we're missing the point. We're missing the point. And as far as China, China, oh, they're polluted. Yeah, they're polluting. They're in transition. And they're, by the way, they're one of the leading manufacturers of electric batteries for cars, which if I if I would be able to get one, the new Honda Fit, it's supposed to come out next year. Um, we're in transition. It's, it's going to happen. And degrowth, degrowth is part of it. We, we're going to we're going to be we're going to be living and doing things in a different way. You know, most of you are not old enough to remember. You know, one time we had horses and we went to cars. Do you remember when we first had cars? Where you got your gasoline? You got it from Sears Roebuck. You got it in a five-gallon can. There weren't any gas stations. They didn't exist. All this is going to change. Bring back the horses. Yeah. What's that? Bring back the horse. Okay, fine. 
<laughs> anyway, we're, we're in transition. I can't really fully imagine what it's going to be, and uh, um, but it's, it, we're, we're all going to be part of it. Uh, at least I'll, I'll, I have a few more years, but it's, it's happening, and it's happening right now. Degrowth is part of it. Uh, we got him. He signed up. <laughs> uh, my wife comes from <coughs> Peru, and her brother-in-law came here to study at the University of Chicago Business School. And what it was, what it is, the uh, the corporation sponsored that for people in Latin America from the upper classes or the middle classes to come to study here and become what they call compador capitalists. In other words, run those countries on behalf of the United States. It's nothing but a form of imperialism, that's all it is. And they make tremendous profit out of it. We've invaded Latin America maybe a hundred <laughs> times already. Uh, if you read Smedley Butler, War is a Racket, he goes into it very strong with Smedley Butler, who was a lieutenant general under the Roosevelt administration, and he invaded Latin America, I don't know how many times, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, just to name the country, and he invaded it. And he said, war is a racket, that's all they're in there for, is to extract raw materials, to extract different uh, fruit products and so forth, and they make tremendous profit. The people that live in these countries uh, live like dogs, and the people in the middle and upper classes are supported by American imperialism, and there's tremendous profit made out of it. And a lot of the profit, what happened to it during the Roosevelt administration, a little bit after, they gave some of that profit to the working people in the United States, the upper class of the working people, the aristocracy of labor, what they used to call. And these people supported American imperialism because they got benefits out of it. But nowadays, they're not getting the benefits because of neoliberalism. The neoliberalism is just another form of imperialism. We invaded Cuba, we invaded Hawaii, we invaded the Philippines around 1898, and since then, we've controlled all of Latin America. It's the Monroe Doctrine. It's our backyard, so to speak. And that's one of the reasons that people are living fairly good. Because the capitalists gave some of the crumbs off their table to the workers in the United States. So you had this type of improvement here. If they didn't, now they're, now they're, now they're not making the profits they used to make. Why? Because they got automation, they got robotics and things of that nature, and they're not making the profits because people don't have the money to buy the products. There's a few of them, they're making fabulous profits, but the majority are not. We got three people, Jeff Bezos, and you got Gates, and you got Warren Buffett that have half the wealth of the United States. It's so top-heavy that eventually, you know what happens to something that's top-heavy? It falls. Yeah, they're going to fall. Next is Paul. I'm Catherine Button from Chicago Area Peace Action, and I have just a couple of disjointed thoughts that I uh, hope will be worth of your time. Um, to the question that Charles had up, talked about, are we ready for change? I would just say that my hope lies in a few things that have happened recently. The Parkland students who said to all of us, don't give us your thoughts and prayers, give us new gun laws. And then two days later they interviewed Marco, Marco Rubio and when he wouldn't commit to being against assault weapons, they said, well, we have to elect different people. That's yeah. so hopeful. These yeah. are high school kids. Mm -hmm. 
Then the other thing that I find very hopeful is that in Chicago we have Sunrise. It's across the country pushing the Green New Deal. We have Extinction Rebellion. That group is wonderful. They've, they've done their homework, but they're saying we're not hanging our hats on electoral politics. So they're out in the streets trying to raise awareness of the need to change. And um, the other thing that um, I just wanted to mention is that as Rachel was talking about the degrowth movement, I'm not sure if it was in Naomi Klein's work, but you know, in Ohio, they evidently have a lot of communities that have developed co-ops and they have developed their own currencies. And it feels to me like that would be very compatible with communities moving to an understanding and implementation of a degrowth movement. Um, and then, of course, we also know that across the country there are many, many, many projects going on in large and small cities where people want to grow their own food because they understand that the big ag companies have really contaminated our food system. So you've got a lot of organic farms, small and medium, that are growing up and tons of farmers' markets. So I think these are all symbolic of the way individual people, little people like us, understand the need to change our system and are already doing it in grassroots ways. Um, and the other thing is, uh, after listening to Rachel do this the first time, I did get a book and I, this is terrible, I don't know the author, but I think it's on her list and it may be debunking the degrowth movement. And it's a very nice primer on the degrowth movement. And it really is quite uh, prominent in Europe. They do a conference every year where they draw thousands of people. And it's still sort of in academia, but it is rippling out of academia. So that's very hopeful. And I hope that we can see it grow here. Um, last but not least, I want to mention that CAPA has an annual dinner every year in the fall. This year, it's September 22nd. Two years ago, we had a speaker talking about um, democracy in chains. Last year, we had a speaker speak on um, help me, you guys. Democracy. 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 Like democracy. Democracy. Something about. It in um, democracy change. It was about democracy. finding our democracy, like we lost it, sort of. Anyway, it's in transition and it's in trouble, we know that. And here, we have a speaker, her name is June Sekira, S-E-K-E-R-A, and she's an economist. Um, I happened to bump into a, a book review. I think her book was published in 2016. I can't tell you the name of it. But she talks about a, an economic theory or framework that would be for an economics that would be for the people. And we're real excited to have her coming on September 22nd as our speaker, a keynote for our dinner. Um, we'd love to see some of you uh, come and hear her speak. I think she's grounded in reality and the fact that an economic system should work for all the people. Thank you. So we're Thank real excited. You. Where's that going to be? Um, that will be actually held at the Unitarian Church in Evanston. Um, it will be an evening dinner. It will be on our website, which is shypeaceaction.org. And I'm sure Rachel will be speaking briefly at that dinner. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. September, Sunday, September 22nd. <clears throat> I think it will still, will still be around there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I've often been a uh, proponent of uh, the fact that uh, our society shouldn't measure its uh, well-being based on the um, mindless uh, so-called growth uh, in the economy. And, uh, and we, we're all aware that we have an economy here which is so-called growth uh, that's espoused by these oligarchs and uh, Trump-like people. Um, that it isn't doing well for most people and that uh, many, many people are falling behind. So. Um, especially, it's a very clumsy, um, a clumsy uh, uh, way of measuring uh, the well-being of the society. And in the 
late seventies, early eighties when I was fairly young. Uh, and I'm approaching sixty-five, so <coughs> don't cry for me, Argentina, too much. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had that bad a life, I guess. Anyway, um, and I won the lottery by living in this country and um, and um, having my white privilege and all that, too. So I'm kind of rambling here, but I just thought I would mention I'm a little tired today uh, <clears throat> running into uh, one of the bad aspects of our e economy, and that is uh, with all the, the developments with technology were supposed to be good for us. I ran into a software program today that's just a horrible thing. It's wasting all my time. Isn't the wastage of our time um, a, 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 a measurement of how bad or how good our society or our economy is doing? Huh? But that beside the point, when in the late 70s, early 80s, I wrote a, a, a book. Uh, it was a, in the way of a stage play also. It could have been performed as a play, but um, it was part of a satire on society, and two of the lines that stuck with me, um, I'd have a hard time reciting any of it now, um, but uh, it reminded me, the talk here reminded me, it's such, a, it's such an incisive, incisive uh, talk here, and uh, so much information that I'm going to try to catch it on the replay. Um, um, and now, after remembering it, I suddenly spaced on it. But, uh, <laughs> Growth of the GNP, the golden idol of a civilization, frankly, suicidal, which means that, um, and even then, there was a growing, a growing movement already, that simplicity might be better, quality of life as a measurement of well-being might be better than this mindless insistence on growth, 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 and just more, 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 more it's material like things. We have a gentleman in the back who's written several books, uh, and I'm helping him with a, another one. That One of the things that uh, he espouses is that the quality of life, uh, the meaning of life, uh, doesn't have to do with material things so much, and that uh, uh, emphasis on those is a bad thing, and that needs to be revisited. But uh, another thing also is that it has led to this impasse where um, the survival of the human species might be uh, uh, damaged or endangered by this incense, in, incessant growth idea. Um, and we have to reverse it in some way, um, especially because of the uh, CO2 uh, problem and the, uh, and the uh, uh, pollution. Uh, even though technological things can be, um, can be proposed for partial solutions, but we run into this terrible uh, thing where we, we, we have to rethink and revisit and go back to even, um, you know, like the idea of the cult counterculture back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, we have to, and we have to find a balanced view. And, uh, and uh, to my mind, uh, uh, I always thought that my life was a higher quality when I had time to invest in reading and intellectual pursuits. Uh, rather than accumulation, mindless accumulation of wealth, which I don't have much of anyway. Right. I should start with a joke. There are three kinds of people in the world, those who understand math and those who don't. All right. Um, uh, First thing is that uh, that I'd like to thank you very much for a very organized, on point, and knowledgeable presentation. And whether people agree with you or not, and I know there are people in here who do not, um, I, I you presented it very very well. Um, I think in term and just as a side note, we have more horses now than we had at the end of the 19th century. So there. Don't ask me why that is, but, but people own more horses now than they did at the end of the 19th century. So, um, well, we're not using it for transportation. <laughs> and, and that may be a positive thing. Okay, um, I think that what happens, I, you know, this consumerist economy um, is, is uh, 
very complicated and all that other jazz. But I think that what happens is is that it's it's we're we're kind of in the belly of the beast that we we benefit from much of the consumerism in some ways and don't benefit in other ways. It depends on where we are in society. So if we're in a lower lower class neighborhoods or not lower class low income neighborhoods who live down by the uh, power plants in Pilsen, then we have a higher rate of cancers and of, of lung diseases. Our children are much more likely to have asthma, um, more, more, more likely to suffer from cancer, um, among other things. And um, the, uh, the, the consumerism obviously is based on consuming and using up resources to make all of this stuff that we use. The, and the way we do that is, um, it is uh, my, my uh, short philosophy for uh, the, the colonialism that we do in other places to get the resources that we need to produce our thing, is that the people who are the owners and the oligarchs or whatever, go into a place and they eat, they shit, and then they leave. And they leave people, they don't, they do not, who they pay off is they pay a small part of their profit off to either the government, who they pay off to support them, and to uh, 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 neutralize or, or get rid of the opposition there. And you've seen this time after time after time in South America with the banana republics and Africa with all of the different uh, kinds of things that have gone on there. And, and, um, and, they, and or if the government is, opposes them, they support a, a, guerrilla a guerrilla movement that does a coup and then that, those people come to power and they get paid off by the companies. So either way, the people on the ground suffer. So you have, uh, you still have people who are not educated, who have no health care, who ha whose uh, air and land and water is, is polluted, um, otherwise destroyed, otherwise made inhospitable by the actions of the capitalists who go to develop the land. So um, I think that. Uh, and, and, and the result of that is that, in fact, now, you know that 350.org, that's 350, 350 parts per whatever it is that's the level that we can't go past. We're at 400, more than 400 now. So we are seeing the, uh, at, at everything, every time something comes out from the, uh, the climate uh, panel, that's, that is the thousands of scientists that are studying this and who study it and write about it, is that the changes are now happening faster and faster and faster. So that uh, a couple of years ago it was going to be in whenever it was, and, now, and they keep moving that closer and closer to us. So the point is, is that we cannot stop climate change. We can only, now, we can't do that anymore. We passed that point. We passed the tipping point. We can only mitigate the effects. So we really have to educate ourselves into what is going on and, um, and, and do what we can to mitigate the effects and um, eliminate our current government. <laughs> All right. Next. You better have a good rebuttal, I hope. Oh, yeah. Good. I enjoyed the talk, especially the parts about mutual aid. Uh, neoliberalism is one of those words that originally... He knows. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, originally, it uh, was a word applied to other people who didn't use that word to describe themselves. Uh, it was never a word that Milton Friedman used to describe himself. He did use the quote, liberal unquote, to describe himself in the tradition of Adam Smith and stuff like that. Today, now you see people use uh, neoliberal in a positive, unironic way, which is kind of cool. Okay. The reason he advocated free trade was not because it was 
beneficial to workers and businesses, but also because trade is great for keeping the peace. Uh, peace activists, uh, including the Chicago Area Peace Action, should look into free trade as a tool for world peace. Speaking of Milton Friedman, uh, as of uh, today, I want to announce uh, that I will be giving a presentation on capitalism and freedom. Friedman's extraordinary masterpiece. That'll be on October 8th, uh, excuse me, October 19th, right here at the College of Complexes. So mark your calendars. Be there or you're a filthy commie. <laughs> Speaking of filthy commies, did you guys uh, hear about this report uh, on Venezuela from the UN? Failed state, Maduro's goons killing dissidents, no food. Of course you tankies will blame it on U.S. imperialism, but I'd love for someone to explain why that means the government killing its own people is somehow okay. Viva Libertad! Next, Jonathan. Thank you to our speaker. Uh, this is one of the best organizations we've had in a long time. I really like the part where you talked about pluriversal world instead of a universal world, and I hope that uh, as soon as possible we can have you come back and talk more about things like that because that was really interesting. Quiet. Um, if you want full employment, we found a solution. It's called uh, full mobilization, all hands on deck to stop climate destruction ecocide. Uh, we do hoard extreme amounts of money to the amount in offshore accounts that we can't fully know exactly what the number is of how much it is. That's how much the ruling class has decided uh, in secrecy over their uh, stockpiles of embarrassing wealth. Uh, They're not embarrassed. You could create full employment, building solar panels, high-speed rail, uh, wind turbines, weatherization of homes, full accessibility in our communities, which saves a lot of energy when the disability community has fully accessible uh, public places and public buildings and housing and schooling and employment places. And, uh, you know, I know what the right-wingers will say. Uh, Jonathan, we have 8 billion people on the planet. It's projected soon. We'll have 10 or 12 billion people on the planet. That's pie in the sky, Pollyanna nonsense. Well, that's another thing that I'd just like to once again remind people, just like I remind people the Republican Party doesn't give a damn about the deficit. The deficit was run up 80% by three presidents. Their names were Reagan, Bush, and some other Republican jackass. Uh, they don't care about population growth either. You know, we're the ones pressing for family planning. We're the ones who can take on the proud mantle of birth control on demand without apology for every, everyone over 18 years old, because that reduces the uh, desperation in communities of poverty. So if you're in a community of poverty in December and January, you know that's the hardest time for young people. So this is for the young people in those desperate economic times when we've got somebody on TV saying we need more trillion dollar military on the 4th of July. That's, that's the best he could do to find out something to be proud of for those young people struggling to just have food. Dollar shortages, December sadness, January red-eye stress, horror stories that the old timers still remember. Some of our strongest, they fell, just like some of our greatest met an early exit. Our humble answer, solution, demand, reply, they're just green paper president dream killers, and yes, they've worn out their while. Dollar photo finish while we ever get out of this 21st web of madness. Job and house, acoustic downtown, street spot and tent. Arm and a leg for tickets to millions of baby in the manger events. Mirage of leadership hyped forth of forfeit die-in. Our holy chance, salvation, proposal, vow, cry. They're just ghosts, keepsakes of an over era, a caved in house, head or tails first dive. We only need to One live to give, all we need to win, we the kin, we the kith. We only need to skid and descent, don't greed nor kills to raise our chins. Because the game, it don't play by the rules. I'm not me, not nobody, nor am I you. When SA keeps forgetting it's you, don't mistake this fake system as the truth. 
God and Lucifer share the same trapdoor who Goliath Jr. is a cat washed dupe, but look what makes all the evening news. Don't be mute when hate's up on the roof. In the land of CEOs, why? Ain't it time? In the cities paved with gold, ain't it time? Rise. For the green paper president dream killers to resign. We know that's not going to happen, but if it was up to all you and I's, not like do or die, more like our future invites, invites us to triumph. Forget these December tears. It's January, child. Celebrate we the peeps who've survived. Thank you to our speaker and a great organization. Okay, once again, um, thank you to the speaker. Uh, nice talk. Uh, my comments are going to be on... Um, read a book, went to see the author at the Chicago Public Library. His thing was, when the Japanese defeated the Russians in like 1907 or something like that in this big naval battle, it was it was a shock that went around the third world. 1905. 1905. Because it was the first time that a Western organization, a Western government, was ever defeated. Okay. Now, here's the thing. So he wrote this book, and here's what he pointed out to me. Okay. So let's start in the 1700s. All right. You got. 1492. You got the Europeans building ships that go around the world. You got the Europeans navigating around the world. You got the Europeans drawing maps of everything around the world. You got the Europeans going everywhere. All right. Then you have. Let's go with music. You have the harpsichord. The harpsichord goes into the piano. They build the violin. They build the saxophone. They build all the all the instruments of the orchestra. All right. They build the orchestra form, all right? They build ballet in the ballet form. They build the opera in the opera form. Now let's get into um, science, all right? They, they distill elements from the air and, and, and world around us. They organize it into a periodic table, okay? They take iron out of the earth, mix it with carbon and make steel. All right? They make boats out of steel that float. They take the Chinese invention of gunpowder and use it for war. All right? The Europeans, with music, give us, just give us so much with music. All right? Let's go on to science. All right? The, the, the periodic table, chemistry, biology, the organization of the, of the uh, fauna and flora and all of that stuff, the scientific classifications, um, science as a discipline, all right? Let's go into uh, telegraph, telegraph over the ocean, instant communication, oh, then we have uh, radio, and then after radio we have talkies, we have film, pictures, and then after pictures we have movies and then we have color movies all right and then we have art and then we have art as a photograph and then we have art as a picasso okay and we music we go in from um bach beethoven um get into the romantics all right go into stravinsky go into the 21st century 20th century stuff okay so anyway, what his point was, back in, let's call it 1850, when the British were marching into India, and they had their marching bands, and they came on steel ships, and they had their automatic rifles, and the Indians, along with everybody else in the world, were still using their basic flute, their basic stringed instrument, their basic um, drum, all right? And here we have this crew coming by, full marching band, play da, 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 coming off of steel ships, etc. And I could just see the wife of one of these guys looking at Abdul and saying, what's wrong with you? Why, why can't you, like, move on? Right? And that was his point. His point about Westerners, it's just the way we are. It's like everybody had slavery. 
the Western curse was to industrialize it. But we industrialize everything. It's just the way we are. It's like if you put like, there's an old joke, okay? Goes like this. You put, you put one brick on an island, and what do you have? You have one brick. You put two on an island, and what do you have? You have a society. And you put three on an island, you know, two on an island, you have a club. Three on an island, you have a society. Right? You put one American on an island, what do you have? One. Put two on an island, what do you have? A partnership. Put three on an island, what do you have? A corporation. And then the last one is whatever you want to do with it. You want to do a Czech, an Indian, an Australian, that doesn't matter. You put one on an island, what do you have? You have one. You put two on an island, what do you have? You have two. You put three on an island, what do you have? You have three. It's like, it's just what we do. It's genetic. Okay, next please. Girl, Charlie. All right. Hey, uh, let's thank our speaker. Oh, you want to go? I'll go after All right. Let's thank our speaker for a very nice presentation and the company PowerPoint that covered a lot of areas here. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, the United Nations has discovered that the one thing that will bring instability in any country is the, is the concept or the situation in which the, the next generation will not experience improved conditions of living. Uh, and people will accept many, many things in life, but they will not accept the fact that their offsprings will have a worsening condition in which to experience. And this will bring about certain certain disturbances within the country. And to say that we're going to have bring it to this it is, it is, it is, it does not appear to be in something that people in the world accept. Um, you, you want some sort of Groundhog Day. And I don't know if that, if you're familiar with the movie, um, if we're going to be able to convince people of that. This concept has been thought about. The this concept of evolution began a social evolution before it was verified into taking place in the biological world by Darwin. The social historians, among them Hegel and philosophers, who said there was a thrust to history uh, and a thrust uh, and. Uh, an omega point, an A to B to history. It was just not standing still. Uh, and does that concept, especially was embraced by the people who made this country, who settled, came here. These people, in fact, were the other extreme. They, they, they believed there, in fact, they, they actually came up with concepts that there was some sort of manifest destiny that they were gonna progress that it was like written in, in the integral nature, into the nature of the world somehow, that they were bound and determined to engage in progress and this great uh, thing here. Now the other thing is in the physical world, they used to think, here's the thing that, that happened was, the Judeo-Christian world was fixed. It was, it was hierarchical. And there's a God and all the way down, angels, man and so forth, the animals, and uh, that, that, that model, uh, paradigm, they use that fancy term, uh, existed for many centuries. Now we use a more circular one, but as that was also discarded because they, they also thought in physics and astronomy and cosmology that the universe was fixed. The planets just went around for the most part. And then they discovered in astronomers that it was not the case. There in fact been a big bang and there, there was a whole concept that planets were in fact expanding in the universe. The universe was an expansive universe. Um, so I don't know if the social laws have application to the physical one, or what the relationship is, but the, the, we have far from to come along and say that we're gonna have a static world 
uh, I, I don't uh, yeah, but the last thing I want to say about horses is this the really thing to give the value of getting rid of horses was the fact that that land was converted back instead of growing food for horses they produce food for people thank you very much come again when you got another one all right all right we're all getting fascism it's coming man yeah these people are accepting it Okay, um, hi, yeah, I'm Ellen Corley, uh, and I love the College of Cup Places, and um, I wanted to say thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Uh, now, I was, I, I'm kind of a member, I've been to a few um, Chicago area peace actions, and uh, so I'm really <coughs> impressed. I'd forgotten, I went to the Michael Clare one that, um, you know that there was environmental and uh, ant and peace, right? And um, I think that's a nice combination, right? Uh, especially you know with your professionalism. Um, so this is wonderful. I'd love to join your coalition. I was at the Chicago at the Socialism 2019 conference. Uh, Naomi Klein is actually speaking tomorrow. She is, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I can tell people more about the time and place. Um, um, at the McCormick uh, Hyatt, you know, down there on like 22nd Street, uh, it's, I'll give you more information, but they've got a wonderful, uh, you should the, hopefully last every going forward, but it's usually the 4th of July every year, this, you know, three, two, three thousand people socialists come and to Chicago for this conference and they um, this year it was always the International Socialist it's now that disbanded but it's the Democratic Socialists are moving in and really picking up the ball uh, but it's you know they've got a, a track for this uh, environmental climate catastrophe track uh, and a um, racism you know uh, anti-racism track and it's I've learned so much going every five years because I mean I was raised by a libertarian Milton Friedman neoliberal person and I you know I was brainwashed and uh, it's taken a while to open up that other side of my brain um, you know we the 70s and then academia you learn these things but uh, and then you know I think a lot of us thought that oh the 80s came the me generation came and um, maybe we you know we would learned enough about socialism we could just go capitalist and it would all work out fine but uh, you know it is kind of a joke really that I, I said at the conference about my mentioned my stepfather because it really is my story I'm adult child of a Republican family and I, I have to <laughs> learn how to um, really recover you know and part of it is their big lies um, that that uh, you know you it really goes back to fascism um, a lot of the research I've done that so uh, more I, I talk about the deep state a lot um, but I'm I want to be involved and uh, keep up this conversation so thank you, thank you. I uh, love the talk, plan on doing some more research on it. Uh, one thought I, uh, that came to mind, uh, yes, I, I really don't have a rebuttal. I thought it was a great, great presentation. Um, but uh, just, okay. just throwing in stuff, uh, you know, how, how do you, I, I think that um, how we measure production is kind of an indicator of some of the problems that we have in the, our society in, uh, in, in the wrong emphasis on what's important in life. And, I, I heard a really interesting uh, program on um, a show on NPR about maybe six weeks ago on uh, GNP, the creation of uh, GNP, and, and something really struck home. They, they mentioned that the guy who invented GNP basically had two very strong recommendations that weren't followed. And the first one is you don't count any kind of production for war the, the military industry towards GNP. 
okay, that he felt was, was really important. And that, and, and then we do the exact opposite. And the second thing he said is that, that it's a really important to, to find a way to um, mathematically include in GNP the value that women provide when they're doing all that work at home. And, and that might be a little uh, misogynistic. In, in these kind of times back then, there was a tremendous amount of women who uh, were homemakers, and that, and even today, man or woman, that 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 work is not <coughs> captured, and therefore it's not valued at all. So I, I found that really interesting, and thought it, it kind of applies to the discussion today in trying to change our, our how we uh, uh, the, the things that we value. Uh, another little economic statistic that really is a pet peeve is when they talk about job creation. They always talk about numbers, but they never really talk about how many of those numbers are basically poverty wages, fast food, Walmart, Target, and uh, it really does irk me because uh, they're not talking about the quality of those jobs, how much people are getting paid, and, and if they have any kind of benefits, and if it's totally 36 hours a week so that they can't get uh, full overtime, that kind of stuff really bugs me. So. The, my my idea, the, the thing that kind of bugs me, and, and I don't have any training in economics, so you're welcome to chastise me if I'm getting stuff wrong, but anybody who's done a home budget or run a small business understand that you can't just look at, at the gross numbers, how much money you're bringing in. You also should compare it to how, what your expenses are. And it's like, how come we're not talking about like net national production? It, it, it blows my mind. It, it, it's, uh, you, there are so many costs that we don't capture, uh, like, um, uh, like the cost to the environment. Just utilizing limited resources, or, uh, uh, or basically uh, where somebody makes a whole bunch of stuff, but then they have, leave a huge mess and then dump it on society to clean up. A whole bunch of examples like that. So, my, just my thoughts. You bring up a good many points tonight. The one that comes to me is the one given by St. Paul. I have learned to be content in all circumstances. I have known want, I have known poverty, and I have known plenty. Paraphrased, what St. Paul meant was that he found an inner peace because of his belief in God and Jesus Christ. I share those same beliefs about our economy and climate change. For me, there is an answer to a lot of this stuff, and that is the profligation of a low-cost, high-volume energy source. And the only way I'm going to see that is through the application of one word, and that's called thorium, in the form of liquid fluoride molten salt reactors, which I think would be small, modular, and contribute a lot to getting off of oil. I will not go much further into it because I've made these relevant arguments at the college before, and there's extensive uh, regionalization on the internet. But there is one thing I do want to say. We are probably in the biggest flowering of human of human knowledge and dignity in, 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 the, in the world at this point. And we have done such things as reduce a lot of abject poverty, increase literacy rates, and a whole other plethora of human accomplishments over the last 50 years. And that's something we can't ignore. The rest of the world is going to continue to develop because money is very important in some cases. The CIA says that about $8,000 per capita income is about the time when children become not so much a source of labor and retirement but an expense. And that does lead to population reduction. You've seen it in the countries like Europe and the United States where we don't have as many children as we used to because they can survive. But it also takes a lot longer 
to get into a good uh, economic position to support yourselves. Kids used to leave the nest at 16, 17, and 18, and now it's more like 20, maybe even 30 by the time some of the new stuff comes along. It, it may be even 40 sometimes. But what I'm simply saying is this. Yes, there is more to life than money. There's more to life than GNP. I myself take a lot of that same uh, assertion and get a, get have a very full life in some outside organizations like Toastmasters and going to my local church. Other than that, I, my time is up. And if anybody wants to do degrowth, go for it. As long as it's voluntary and as long as you have free association while doing it. Thank you. Ready to get this in three minutes or less. Um, some observations. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, I'm Andy Anderson, and my brother and I run an information service out of Palatine. We call it database translations. We take 5, 10, 15, 20 books like this, and we translate. Uh, we call it a database translation, but we summarize books into a one-page cliff notes that you can read in five minutes. So if you don't have time to read 10 or 20 or 30 books on each of these subjects that we're talking about, Kim, I'm sorry. I wanted to say something. Go on, please. I'm sorry, Andy. The summary, if you don't have time to read, you know, 10, 20, 50 books on the subject she was talking about tonight, I'll give you a quick soundbite summary of each of those things. The main one is, um, the future, if we have one, belongs to solar, wind, high efficiency, everything, and get off fossil fuels pretty much in the next 10, 11 years. We have happen. to get a World War II type program started immediately and have it up and running in a massive amount of hardware, solar, wind, all kinds of things, built by 2025. Uh, in answer to one of your questions out there, no, the world's not coming to an end in 2030. The window of opportunity to prevent the catastrophic climate change that our kids are going to be facing in 30 and 40 years, that window closes in 2030. It won't matter what we do after 2030 if we don't get a massive amount of action going now, this year, next year. Okay? Naomi Klein spelled that out in her book called This Changes Everything. And I can't wait to get a copy of her, you know, that growth book. Uh, as Greta said, all of you, uh, Greta, is, Greta Thunberg has a new book out. It's called uh, No One is Too Small to Make a Difference. And it's a brilliant little book. You can order it online from Amazon. As she said, the problems, the problems that we're faced with have already been solved. We don't need to study to develop new things to solve the climate crisis. What we need is action from the adults that control uh, our governments. This book describes better than any other, it's called Predator Nation, I mentioned it before. It describes how our countries, especially this one, is run by a handful of billionaire predators. I call them billionaire predator pimps and their stable of intellectual prostitutes in the Senate and the Congress. Because that's the dictionary definition of intellectual prostitution. You take money to do base or evil things. The other definition, of course, is selling sex. But if we recognize and do something about it and join the kids, there's a big movement coming up on September 20th. The walk out there. The Climate uh, the Fridays for the Future group are calling for all adults to take off a day of work if you don't have them. Is everybody familiar with that? Raise your yes. hands if anybody's heard about that. Taking a day off from work on September 20th to join the kids. Oh, yeah. The movement's oh, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Climate and strike. The, the girl Global that started strike. it was there today. Climate strike. Climate strike, yeah. Right, 20 so seconds. Give our, mm -hmm. uh, give our speaker tonight a big hand and she gets the last word. Come on up and uh, if you have any last thoughts of uh, rebuttal to what you heard from yeah. the different people. Did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Okay, okay. okay. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Our last speaker, then we'll... Our... This is our last rebutter. All right. 
I just heard denounced as a pipe dream the idea that, of, that we could do something about climate change. Well, in 1961, the President of the United States, back when the United States elected really the President, President Kennedy said that we should have as our goal the idea of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Well, if we could do that, I, can argue, I would argue we can do something in the Times a lot of, about climate change. Finally, the other thing I wanted to talk about is something perhaps many of no consequence. So, but during my boyhood and, and since, one of the biggest institutions for demolishing uh, the um, phoniness of consumers and everything else was a publication known as Mad Magazine. <laughs> oh, and and sadly, it is, sadly, it is about to go out of business Ooh. after 67 years. Apparently, time has passed this by. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, you get the last word. All right, let's give our speaker a little, let's give our uh, speaker her last attention. She's getting her, her last word. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, the first thing, I want to go back to that elephant picture because um, I want to be clear that uh, we're thinking about something different than, than what we know. Um, I heard some capitalist uh, people. Um, and it's different than capitalism, it's different than communism, different than uh, socialism. It is, um, I think everybody can value happiness and care and quality and, and community. I mean, right here is community. And so thinking about those values is sort of where we want to go towards the future. And that may be different than, than what we know of now. Um, and then I want to read this quote from a book I was reading about freedom because um, Sir over there was talking about uh, Milton Friedman in his book and kind of some quotes and I can't uh, kind of um, argue with that because I haven't read him but I can say um, a few things that I have read um, that there are two kinds of freedom one good and the other bad among the latter the freedom to exploit one's fellows or the freedom to make inordinate gains without commensurable service to the community the freedom to keep technological inventions from being used for public benefit, or the freedom to profit from public calamities secretly engineered for private advantage. The market economy under which these freedoms throve also produced freedoms we prize highly. Freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of meeting, freedom of association, freedom to choose one's own job. While we may cherish these freedoms for their own sake, they were to a large extent byproducts of the same economy that was also responsible for evil freedoms. Thus will old freedoms and civic rights be added to the fund of new freedoms generated by the leisure and security that industrial society offers to all. Um, so I don't want the freedom that we know to only be the freedom of enterprise and there to be other freedoms. Um, and then I want to end uh, real quick with, um, has anybody uh, ever, does anybody know what this is, what I have up here? I've been holding it up. Dave does, because he was at my last talk. Um, has everybody, anybody ever been to Argentina? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is mate. Anybody know what mate is? Can you use the mic? Yeah, mate is a tea. Mate, mate is a tea, yes. Um, so it's a special tea uh, in Argentina. You get this vase or kind of gourd. A lot of times it's made from a gourd. In this case, I have a wooden one. Mine says, destroy the patriarchy, not the planet. That's just, you know, individualized, but there's others. And then you've got a straw that has a filter at the end. Um, and then you have this tea, which I have here. I have it in an old peanut butter jar, but um, it's pretty bitter. And I'm not gonna do it now, but you pour the tea inside and then you heat up water, and many people have a thermos, kind of like mine, like this, and you pour it in the water, hot water, and then it's drank um, in community. It's very highly caffeinated, you don't drink this alone. And you take, uh, you sip it all, so all the water that's poured in, you drink it all, and then the person that serves pours it again and then passes it along to the next person. And it's drank in when, whenever somebody comes into your home or uh, you're meeting someone at a park, it's 
quieres mate? Do you want mate? And it's always served. And um, it's all about sort of this um, community. Um, and I want to read a quick quote to end um, about mate because I think it really um, talks about these values uh, that are very important to humanity. Um, and I'm going to read it in Spanish first and then I'll translate it. I think that gives the essence a little bit more. El mate es simplemente el mate y es además mucho más que eso. El mate une, reencuentra, rompe el hielo, acompaña, es bueno para la salud, estimula, calma chantos, ayuda a pensar, nos enseña a compartir. Y esto no se puede explicar para que quienes nunca han tomado mate lo entiendan, hay que simplemente invitarlos a tomar uno. And what that means is, el mate is simply mate, and it all is also much more than that. The mate unites, rediscovers, breaks the ice, accompanies, calms crying, helps you to think, teaches us to share, and all this cannot be explained. For those that have never experienced mate do not understand that all you have to do is simply invite them to take a sip. I want to end with that, that it's about community, sharing, feeling, and accompanying one another as we move forward into the future, hopefully a better future. Well, thank you. Okay, Andy, in this place. In this place, Andy. For devil us out, Andy. Here, here's the gap. Okay, thank you all for coming. We are adjourned for the night. It's over. Thank you. See you next week. I personally like the one with Kali for the Pope blessed. Him. This Satan's brew is so the, the one where Pope Pius blessed Kali. This Satan's brew is so delicious. It's a pity to let the infidels have exclusive music. Nobody shall baptize it to the call of a Christian beverage. Can you give me a ride? Yes, I'll give you a ride. Right. I, I Looks like who's the woman that's your board of directors? Yeah, she left. She left. Yeah. Okay. So I. Uh, but um. Yeah.